I don't even use this mic. That's the irony, the irony of it. <laughs> I use this one. I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So if you have not read it or seen the movies, you have to bear with me for about the first page. So hang tight. But I love the movies and the books for many reasons, and I could go on for the whole sermon, but I'll restrict myself. One of the reasons I love these uh, books and movies is because of how in tune these characters are with their emotions. I bet you thought I was gonna say magic. That's reason two. <laughs> this trilogy is full of powerful, fierce people, men and women, elves, human, dwarves, hobbits, crying, embracing, apologizing, sharing their fears and their hopes, and otherwise being pretty emotionally healthy. And this is especially refreshing to some of us who might be used to environments where being open about your feelings is not really valued. This could have been work or home or maybe both. Some people might think it makes them look weak. We might feel embarrassed to cry in front of other people or share our emotions. Others of us might have been taught to view our emotions as something to beat into submission <laughs> and control. Anyone? Yes, me. <laughs> Some of us aren't always comfortable talking about our feelings with other people. But the Lord of the Rings shows a different way of being. You have Aragorn, the rightful king of Gondor, and holding Boromir's hands, weeping as he dies, and kissing him on the forehead to say goodbye. You have Gandalf, one of the most powerful beings in the whole trilogy, this powerful wizard, confessing his fears and feelings of insecurity to his friends. And you have Gladriel, a queen of the elves, talking openly about her anger and the temptation she felt from the ring. I go on, there's many, many examples of this. And no one watching these movies would watch those powerful characters and think less of them for showing their feelings. Instead, I think they end up looking more powerful. I think it added to the popularity of the books and movies because these characters did openly what many of us struggle with, noticing, feeling, expressing, and sharing their emotions. We end up admiring and respecting them more instead of less. The Apostle Paul comes to a similar conclusion today in this reading from 2 Corinthians. In this letter, he described some of the struggles he was facing, and he called them a thorn in his flesh. He was struggling to feel uh, elated. He was depressed. He was feeling uh, despair. He couldn't feel hopeful. And it made him feel insecure. And he prayed for help. Three times he prayed for help. Finally, Jesus answered, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul finally finds peace within himself and with his abilities. He said, therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, it is then that I am strong. Statements like this convince me that Paul really was an apostle close to Christ's heart, despite the fact that they never walked together during Christ's ministry on earth. His only meeting with, with Jesus was this magical, uh, amazing conversion experience where he sees this light and becomes blinded. But Jesus loved to make the same kind of reversal statements. He did it all the time. Perhaps the most famous was the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Even the birth of Christ is a great reversal. God came to earth as a vulnerable baby rather than a great king or a mighty conqueror. And Paul's statement follows this same trend. It's an unexpected reversal. God's power is made perfect in weakness. When I am weak, then I am strong. I have read these words many times since my childhood 
in the Baptist church, memorizing Bible verses and Sunday school in VBS for the prize of chocolate. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Despite that, I don't know that I ever really understood these words, this particular verse. What does it mean that when you're weak, that's when you're strong? I didn't really get it, but I memorized it and got my chocolate anyway. I think I finally came to understand what Paul meant back in 2018. Back then, I was a chaplain resident at Harborview Medical Center in downtown Seattle. And as a resident, I was responsible for providing spiritual care to several units, including the trauma ICU, the burn ICU, the pediatric ICU, along with some acute care units. And February of 2018 was about halfway through that program. And I really hit a wall at that point. For weeks, I had been spending time with a family after they had survived a house fire. The father uh, was disabled by the burns. Um, one of the children didn't make it. And the other child was so sick that uh, none of us knew what would happen. That week in February 2018, one day early that week, I spent uh, about four hours or so with that family. We're in a palliative care meeting trying to figure out next steps. And we gave the uh, parents basically room to say whatever they needed to say, express everything they were feeling, all the, all the emotions, anger, fear, sadness, everything. Ask every question they could think of. So of course, it took four hours. It was hard, hard meeting. After that meeting, I was barely holding it together. I went back to my supervisor, told her about this meeting I had just come out of with the palliative care team, and uh, I said, I don't know if I have anything left to give today. And I felt very ashamed saying that, like I should be able to just power through. And maybe she'd tell me to, but she didn't. She told me to go home, so I did. Uh, the very next day, I spent hours and hours with a different family, another situation that ended in tragedy, and another parent that had to say goodbye too soon. And by that point, my heart was very tired, very tired. The day after that was our education day. So there was one day a week where all the residents would get together and we wouldn't see patients that day. We would stay in a room with our supervisors and we would talk about patient situations. We'd talk about things we were learning. Uh, we would have guest speakers come in to teach us about medical things or um, different uh, listening and counseling techniques, so an education day. Also on that day, we tended to get really real with each other and be really honest about how things were going. And that day, when it was my turn to share with the group about how I was doing, I really couldn't hold it together. I could barely talk. I started crying immediately. Finally, I managed to say to them, through my tears, I don't know if I can do this job anymore. I can't bear to watch another child leave this, wor this world too soon and to hold on to another parent while they watch. I don't think I can do this. I kind of looked down and cried for a while, and I was scared to look back up and meet all of their eyes. So wiped my face and I thought to myself, when I look up, is this when they tell me, maybe this isn't the job for you? Or gently invite me to leave the program? I was worried about that. Maybe I can't cut it here. But when I looked up, everyone else in the room was crying too. And they said, Hillary, we can't think of a more normal response to these things than to cry. I was amazed. I was surprised. Even my two supervisors, these were two chaplains and educators with between them decades of experience in hospitals. And they too, they were, hadn't been in these situations, were just bawling their eyes out right along with me. And one of them, uh, Jill, my supervisor, asked me, Hillary, what's that look on your face about? 
She always could tell. She could always tell. And I said, I was really afraid you were going to kind of gently fire me <laughs> or invite me to resign for not being able to cut it. And she said, what are you talking about? We know you can handle this because you do care, because you do let your feelings out and you let yourself be impacted by these situations instead of shutting down and getting cold. That's how we know you can do it. I wasn't so sure, really. I mean, I was reassured, but I wasn't positive that I believed them. But the next day, 7.30 in the morning, I was on the bus, the, the three bus, heading back to Harborview for another day. And I got a call from one of the other chaplains. And Juliana told me there was another kid, another tragedy waiting on me. And she volunteered to take it. She said, I know you had a hard day yesterday, and um, I, I can do this for you if you don't want to. But I told her no, because in that moment, I actually felt ready. I thought, this is going to be really hard, and I can do this, because I had had that moment the day before to really let it all out. In being vulnerable, I felt more powerful. Like, maybe God put me here for a reason. Maybe I can handle it. And on that bus ride down 3rd Avenue and up James Street, this very Bible verse from St. Paul in 2 Corinthians came to mind. God's power is made perfect in weakness. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And for the first time ever, I think I understood what that meant. So don't be afraid of feeling your emotions or sharing them with other people. Don't be afraid of your tears. After all, it was Gandalf the wizard who said, I will not say do not weep, for not all tears are in evil. And more importantly, it was Christ who said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So children of God, remember, when you choose to be vulnerable, you are actually becoming powerful. When you feel weak, it is then that God has made you strong. Amen.